Today we're talking about gallbladder disease. At the end of this lecture, you will know what a gallbladder is, how it causes your problems, and if you're going to a physician, you'll at least be super informed. If you're a medical student, you'll have a good base of knowledge to start your surgery rotation. Gallbladder. So what is it? Gallbladder holds bile acids produced by the liver that is released when it's time to eat a spicier fatty meal. So let's say you go eat a hamburger, piece of pizza, fried chicken. Your body can't handle that amount of fat all of a sudden. So the gallbladder stores bile. What that does is then is released out when you eat a spicy or fatty meal and it helps your body digest it. That comes into play later down the line when we talk about symptoms. This is all kind of centered around gallstones. Now gallstones by themselves are not a problem. The issue is if you have pain and you have gallstones, you may be somebody that is undergoing gallbladder disease. You can talk for days about why gallstones are formed but realistically, it's about a triangle. Combining cholesterol, bile salts, and phospholipids or fats. Anytime you get an imbalance in one of those, you start forming stones. If you have a slight imbalance, you form sludge. Things that cause you to have problems and form stones or something like weight loss because you have an increase in fat and then a quick decrease in fat. So a lot of times, especially after bariatric surgery when I perform sleeves, you'll see patients develop gallbladder disease and it's just because of that rapid weight loss. Increase and decrease in cholesterol can do it as well as bile salt formation. Now bile salt formation that causes gallstones is a little different. That's usually somebody that has underlying liver disease, so like cirrhosis of the liver. You will see patients with cirrhosis develop a lot of gallstones. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are a problem. It just means that they're forming gallstones. In patients with hepatitis or any type of liver disease, it is sometimes hard to tell whether or not they have a bad gallbladder or if they are just forming stones because of their underlying liver disease. And realistically, their symptoms are pretty similar. So a lot of times we'll get phone calls of patients with cirrhosis of the liver that also have gallstones. And usually just because of their underlying liver disease, we don't take those out unless we absolutely 100% know that their gallbladder is causing problems. Now, as far as signs and symptoms, the classic one is right upper quadrant abdominal pain radiating to your back, worse when you eat spicy or fatty foods. Associated with that pain is significant nausea, but you actually don't have vomiting. That's not a very common cause in gallbladder disease. If you have nausea or vomiting, you start thinking either a really bad gallbladder or you're looking at something like gastroenteritis or some other disease or maybe an ulcer. Fevers, really a late sign, not something that you see in chronic gallbladder disease. Usually this pain, like we talked about, starts in the epigastric area right here and radiates around the right side to your back. You can see variable amounts of diarrhea and constipation. And really it just depends on what your symptoms are. Some people, if they have a biliary obstruction, they can have constipation. Depending on what symptoms you have and how your gallbladder is dysfunctioning, you can have constipation or you can have diarrhea. We'll get into that later, that's a whole nother conversation, but realistically, bile salts can influence the amount of diarrhea or the amount of constipation that you have. If you have too much bile salts, you can actually have diarrhea. If you don't have enough bile salts and you're used to it, you can have constipation. You also can develop jaundice. Jaundice is where you have a stone that gets stuck in your duct and the bile that is usually produced by the liver spills over into your bloodstream. What that happens is it causes your eyes to be yellow. Uh, we always call it big bird eyes. You can also um, see your stools change color. So that's another sign of biliary disease. Specifically, your stools will become light. So we always describe light stools are associated with a obstruction. If that's the case, we don't really talk about taking out your gallbladder first. We need to find out what that obstruction is about. That obstruction can be from a gallstone stuck. It can actually be from a cancer. Um, it could be from anything that is blocking bile from coming out of your liver going into your small intestine. Sludge versus stones versus nothing. You don't have to have anything in your gallbladder for it not to work. That's called biliary dyskinesia. 
sludge stones are a good way to judge how bad your gallbladder is and that's usually based on um, the amount of time that it's been bad um, the easiest way to think of it is bile is like water when it turns into sludge it's a pre gallstone substance kind of like motor oil and then you have gallstones not quite that simple but that's a good way to think about it as far as determining whether or not you have a bad gallbladder that needs to come out there are a couple of diagnostic tests that we have to do. Ultrasound is a good place to start. Uh, that's usually what most people have in the United States. The other test is called a HIDA scan. You'll also see it called a PIPIDA scan some places. Um, the PIP and the HI are just the radioactive isotopes that they use to perform the test, but they're the same test they're performed the same way. <clears throat> ERCP, MRCP, those come into play when you have severe jaundice. The HIDA scan, what it does is it looks at your gallbladder to see if you have a gallbladder that is functioning correctly. So it will tell us an ejection fraction. So ejection fraction, anything less than 40% is abnormal. Every once in a while, we'll see someone with an ejection fraction of 95%. Um, so these hypermobility patients, they also can benefit from gallbladder disease, but that's a complex subset of gallbladder disease that really only the surgeons talk about. With regards to the ultrasound, the main reason you do an ultrasound first and then a HIDA scan is because there's this theoretical thought that if you have gallstones and you perform a HIDA scan and you give them what's called cholecystokinin or CCK that causes your gallbladder to squeeze out, you may shoot a stone into the duct and cause an attack. I don't think that's really the case. It probably can happen, but it's not that common. And if it does happen, then we know that the gallbladder needs to come out. I've never seen it, but you know, it is what it is. With regard to the ERCP and the MRCP, the nice part about those two tests is that one is invasive, one is non-invasive. The MRCP is basically an MRI with biliary contrast. They will look to see if there's a stone or a blockage. It's a good screening test for someone that's either unstable or for whatever reason can't undergo an ERCP. An ERCP is basically a scope that we use to look inside the small intestine into the duct for the biliary system. What that does is allows us to not only look and see if there's a stone, it also allows us to remove a stone if we see one. If someone has a leak after gallbladder surgery, then we can also put a stent across the leak so that they don't continue to drain bile into the abdomen, which is really not a big deal unless it's a lot or it forms a lot of fluid underneath the liver that can't drain and that's called a biloma. With regards to stone removal, nobody does that. We used to, made a lot of money off of, at least hospitals did and the company that made the machine did, but the stones always come back because remember the stone is not the problem. It's the gallbladder that's the issue. As far as taking out a gallbladder, that's usually what we do majority of the time. There are other options like substances like Actigol. Actigol is a substance that you can use to dissolve gallstones. It can sometimes cause diarrhea, not common, but it does happen. And it's not something we do long term because as soon as you stop taking the Actigol, the gallstones form back. So we typically use it in patients that are symptomatic, but for whatever reason can't have surgery. It kind of makes their sludge more like water or it makes stones more like sludge. So the theoretical belief is that it decreases the amount of symptoms that you have with a gallbladder disease. The mainstay of gallbladder treatment in the United States is cholecystectomy. If you can't have a cholecystectomy, we used to do what's called a biliary drain. So we would actually put a drain in the gallbladder, drain out, get rid of all the pressure, get rid of all the bile, symptoms go down. But we've done a couple of studies and it looks like the long-term morbidity mortality is higher doing that than it is if you go ahead and take the gallbladder out. So outside of placing a drain and actigol, the rest of everybody has their gallbladder removed. There are two ways to do it. One is laparoscopically, one is open. If you're doing it laparoscopically, uh, we usually make trocars somewhere around the belly button and throughout the abdomen. The classic presentation is one in the belly button, one here, one here, one here. That is the way we used to do it when we first came out with gallbladder surgery. And that's because what happens is if you have to do an open case, you can connect these dots and the gallbladder lives right here. 
For me, my purpose is always put a trocar here and I remove this one. So I have more of a 36912 approach. Gallbladder lives underneath the liver. The liver basically is a big organ that sits right here and the gallbladder sits right under it. When I face this too much, it turns dark. It doesn't hit my back. I don't know why that is, but we can make it light. That's so funny. That was, that always trips me out. So what we do with surgery is essentially go in, cut that duct and remove the gallbladder. There's an artery that runs right next to it. That artery is the most complicated problem, not because it's difficult to get, it's because that artery is the most common cause of complications or someone requiring a repeat surgery for gallbladder um, after they've had the gallbladder out. Once you get that out, those clips stay in there forever. They don't erode anywhere. You're doing fine. Um, just one quick anatomy thing is that your intestine comes like here, comes around. The bile duct comes here. Pancreas goes here, liver goes here, gallbladder comes here. So that's what it looks like. When we were talking about stones, the stones can get lodged right here at the sphincter of Odi. Um, and on this side is called the ampulla of Vater. The ampulla is a hole and the sphincter is basically the muscle that goes around it. So you can have stones in here that leak out into the bile duct. Now, the other thing that you've noticed is the pancreatic duct comes in here as well. If you get a stone stuck in here, your pancreas can get inflamed and that's called pancreatitis. Whole nother conversation. So the whole goal of taking your gallbladder out is resolution of symptoms. Right after that surgery, you shouldn't have any more right upper quadrant abdominal pain, radiating to your back, nausea, vomiting, fevers, and chills. If you can get all these symptoms resolved, then you've had a successful surgery. You can have these symptoms come back, and that usually means there's a complication. It could be a leak from one of those clips. It could be a stone that's stuck. It could be a host of things. So if you have any of these problems right here, go see your doctor. The last one you worry about, actually, it's actually pretty cool. I think I can do it this way, um, is reformation of gallstones or jaundice two years after surgery. That usually means you may be what's called a common bile duct stone former. So that's someone that actually has, for whatever reason, the ability to form stones in the duct. If that's the case, you will eventually need a sphincterotomy, which is where we open up that sphincter of Odi so that that duct is wide and stones can fall out readily. You also may have to have a stent placed, a biliary stent that has to come out anywhere from six months on, depending on your symptoms. Hope this covers everything you wanted to know about gallbladder disease. We'll keep doing these lectures. If you have any questions, just put them in the comments, email me, hit me up on Instagram, DM, whatever, and we'll get you taken care of. Good luck. Take care. Now look at me and look at Jen. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, prove it. Prove it, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, look how tall I am, Look, look at that. That's ridiculous. Am I that short? I think, no, it's just the way that the camera looks. It's but, not the way the camera, I'm right. looking at her. She comes up to your nipples. Right, but it's kind of like, when you look at it, when you look at it on the camera. I look like a dwarf. Right, and I look huge. <laughs> yes, hi, today George Crawford. <laughs>